Bridges are some of the world's most impressive feats of engineering. They have the power to connect millions of people, transforming economies and politics alike. Here, we've rounded up some of the biggest and most challenging bridges being built around the world. Sit back, relax and take it all in. It's the world's most recognizable bridge and an icon of America. The Golden Gate of San Francisco, one of the most difficult underwater construction feats ever attempted. Defying incredible odds during its construction, the Golden Gate has stood for over 80 years and remains a critical piece of infrastructure, not just a pretty sight. Today, it's almost impossible to imagine San Francisco without this engineering marvel on its skyline. Unless you look to Hollywood, they love to imagine it. But these frightening visions are now a very real possibility, thanks to a threat that's loomed over California for decades. Seismologist Lucy Jones says the recent earthquakes are sending a message that an even bigger one is lurking. The term the big one, it's such a big event you change the nature of society. The iconic Golden Gate Bridge may not survive this massive earthquake unless it's given some serious upgrades. Fortunately though, that's now what it's getting in the form of this huge seismic retrofit project that should see it stand for many more years to come. It's vitally important that we protect this icon, not just so people can come and take photos, but so that our region can continue to function after a major seismic event. For decades, this remarkable bridge has stood as one of the most compelling and awe-inspiring monuments to the power and potential of human ambition, a bold and formidable source of wonder for people of all ages and, of course, tomorrow's young engineers. The structure simply has to keep standing, if only to remind us of what's possible when we believe that we can. This is the story of one of the world's greatest feats of engineering, of how the Golden Gate Bridge came to be, and of how it's now preparing for the big one. There aren't many things more symbolic of America than this long stretch of steel that sits just north of San Francisco. Many factors have contributed to its iconic status, from its size, looks and location to its countless movie appearances. But what's often forgotten is the incredible tale of its construction. Long before the bridge, the mile-long Golden Gate Strait divided these two pieces of land. It's incredibly wide and deep at over 100 meters and has fast flowing waters. So back in the 1920s, most people discounted building any kind of structure as a way to cross it. The only way to get from one side to the other, unless you fancied a very long drive, was by ferry. But as car ownership took off in America to the point where millions of vehicles were piling onto these boats every year, the service became far too congested. Another way over the water was sorely needed, and in the eyes of city officials, a bridge would do nicely. But turning such a bold and daring idea into reality wasn't going to be easy, as the Strait's geography presented extreme challenges. To take on the task, the city appointed engineer Joseph Strauss. He had a great track record in bridges, but his ideas weren't always to everyone's taste. The Golden Gates was no exception, and his first design, tabled in 1921, was widely criticised. Reluctantly, Strauss agreed to work with three other engineers and architects on a new iteration. This one was approved by both the government and the public, and went on to eventually become the bridge we all know and love today. By 1929, the vision was complete, but for the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District, that's a special company that had been set up to build and operate the bridge, the challenges had only just begun. 
The team was met with thousands of legal challenges from the firm that ran the ferries who wanted to stop the project. On top of that, what was then called the US Department of War was concerned the structure would become a sitting duck for enemy bombers and that the bridge wouldn't be visible enough in foggy conditions. They even called for it to be painted yellow and black so you couldn't possibly miss it, a decision we're kind of glad got overruled. Then came a huge financial crisis which triggered the Great Depression and wipes out all of the planned government funding. To keep the project alive and in a remarkable demonstration of public support for the bridge, the people of San Francisco voted for a $35 million bond issue using their homes as collateral. At long last, construction could begin. It's hard to imagine how the first teams must have felt in January 1933, arriving at the site on day one and looking at the huge expanse of water that lay in front of them. Their belief in their own abilities to build such a structure is awe-inspiring. Things all started with the two main towers. Standing over 220 meters tall, these immense structures each required 40,000 metric tons of steel. Both were built in prefabricated sections shipped all the way from the east coast via the Panama Canal. The North Tower came first and was by far the easier of the two to build, mostly because it sits on the land. But the tower towards the south side of the strait was a lot trickier. Building over 300 meters out in the sea, surrounded by water, is not easy. First, a large oval barrier was constructed at the end of a temporary pier, which would also act as the base. Nicknamed the bathtub for obvious reasons, it was done by pouring concrete into a wooden formwork through underwater tubes. When it was set, the water inside was pumped out, allowing more concrete and steel reinforcement to be added inside before the tower itself could start to rise above. At around the same time, the huge anchorages for the suspension cables that would lie on either side of the strait were built too. Altogether, that took around three years to complete. With the massive towers in place, the task of connecting them with cables began. With shipping lanes closed, a boat was used to pull the first wires across the strait. They were then lifted up into cradles at the top of each tower by a crane. Next, a platform was set up so the rest of the wire strands could be sent across the straits and secured into those anchorages before being passed back again. It's a very long and drawn out process known as spinning. Just over six months later, more than 27,000 individual wires had been spun with a combined length of around 80,000 miles. Hydraulic presses had compacted them into single large cables and for the first time, there was a physical man-made link across the strait. Then came the bridge deck. To build this, vertical cables were hung down from the main ones to support steel trusses. This was done right across the bridge until the two sides connected. Concrete was then poured onto this base, creating the roadway, the last major piece of the puzzle. Now, as you've probably noticed, health and safety was a little bit more laid back than it is today. Those at the top of the towers worked for months in 45 mile an hour winds over 200 meters above the water. And there were sadly many instances of workers falling from the bridge. Despite the multiple fatalities, the addition of a safety net did save many lives too, with survivors becoming members of what was dubbed the Halfway to Hell Club. Tragedy struck on one occasion when a machine fell into the net, taking many workers with it. The net collapsed under the weight of all the machinery, and 10 people were killed. Finally, in 1937, the bridge that no one thought could ever be built was completed on budget and ahead of time, opening to much fanfare. May 27, 1937. Opening day number one was just for people. 200,000 people showed up and paid a nickel each to walk across. Fifty years later, the city held a similar pedestrian walkover to celebrate the bridge's anniversary. But in half a century, the Golden Gate had gained a lot more admirers. There were 800,000 people that made it onto the bridge, quite a lot. Serious overcrowding saw the typically arched bridge flatten under the immense weight of the crowd. An extremely dangerous incident that's led officials to commemorate anniversaries in different ways ever since. 
Today, the Golden Gate is as important as when it was first opened. Just ask US Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. This bridge plays an indispensable role in the safe movement of countless people and goods across this region. 37 million vehicles cross it every year, including half a million freight trucks. And it's used by huge numbers of pedestrians and cyclists too. Clearly, it would leave a huge hole, both literally and figuratively, if anything bad were to happen to it. And we already know what that would look like, because we've seen it multiple times in the movies. It's been nuked, destroyed by a tsunami, and even bitten in half by a giant shark. Thankfully, in the real world, it remains very much intact, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to worry about. You see, the bridge, though seismically engineered when it was first built, was constructed right in between two fault lines, meaning it sits in the middle of an earthquake zone. To make matters worse, experts have been saying for years that this part of California is overdue for a particularly large quake known as the Big One. We are due for the Big One. A reminder that the Bay Area, we're still at risk of that Big One coming. It is the big fear for the people of California, and they know that someday, sometime, it will happen. This could be devastating to buildings and infrastructure in the area, including the Golden Gate. Other bridges and roads around the bay have fallen victim to seismic activity in the past, like the Cypress Freeway in nearby Oakland. Oh my god, look at that. Um, the freeway has just completely collapsed. Back in 1989, the 7.1 magnitude Loma Prieta earthquake hit the region, causing 68 deaths, thousands of injuries, and billions of dollars worth of damage. Afterwards, the Golden Gate Highway and Transportation District conducted a vulnerability study on the structure. It found that an earthquake of magnitude 7 with an epicenter close to the bridge could cause severe damage to it. And if an even bigger one hit, with a magnitude of at least 8, the viaducts leading up to the bridge could be at risk of collapse. Now, while the bridge is deemed safe today, the decision was taken to undertake a full seismic retrofit in four phases. The first one, which took place between 1997 and 2001, focused on the North Approach Viaduct, where the anchorage for the cables on the Marin side of the bridge is kept. That work included strengthening the foundations of the area, replacing four supporting steel towers and strengthening them, installing seismic expansion joints, installing isolator bearings, that minimize the effects of ground motions on the structure and the, and the trusses specifically. These isolator bearings sit on the horizontal supports underneath the roadbed and the four vertical towers, reducing the amount of seismic energy transferred from the ground to the trusses. They're made up of thin layers of rubber and steel with a lead core in the center. This enables them to move laterally in the event of an earthquake while retaining high vertical stiffness, with the core deforming and acting as a damper. Phase 2, which took place between 2001 and 2008, saw a lot of the same work from Phase 1 repeated, but on the south side, with a few notable exceptions. The southern end has the distinctive Fort Point Arch, which was upgraded into a giant energy damping element, with new bearings, energy dissipation devices, and isolation joints. Surrounding the arch are two massive concrete pylons, which were modified so they too dampen seismic energy. It was achieved by expanding their foundations both above and below the surface, drilling holes deep into the bedrock and inserting pre-stressed steel tendons. All of this means the pylons can now rock in the event of an earthquake, with the tendons pulling them back into place. The bridge is safe today after the second phase of the seismic retrofit was complete for an earthquake up to a low eight in magnitude. And so once that phase was completed, we with a large sigh of relief. Our work is not fully done uh, as we're, we embark on the last phase. So if a high magnitude earthquake were to hit near the bridge today, there's still a chance this critical transport link would need to close afterwards, even after all that work. But now, following the completion of Phase 3A in 2014, which focused on strengthening the anchorage on the north side, Phase 3B is almost ready to begin. In December 2022, the bridge secured a $400 million federal grant as part of the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law. That's around half of the total needed for the final phase. The rest is coming from state funds and tolls. 
It's a lot of money, but this last phase is the biggest of all, retrofitting the main suspension element. It involves strengthening the span by replacing the top lateral bracing system with over 250 floor beams and installing more seismic energy dissipation devices. In an earthquake, special plates made from stainless steel and bronze will slide together using a process called abrasive friction to limit seismic forces on the structural components. The towers themselves are also being upgraded. The bases are being strengthened and equipped with steel plates, new structural steel is going in, and they're getting a lick of paint too. It's all a lot of work, and it's going to take three decades and several billion dollars in total, but it simply has to happen. Not just so we can all admire this beautiful, fantastic bridge, but so that this part of America keeps moving. In fact, right across the US, there are similar cases of bridges that were built a long time ago, now in urgent need of improvements, albeit for many different reasons. Some 46,000 bridges around the country are considered structurally deficient. They might not be in earthquake zones or have the same iconic status. But if nothing is done to these crumbling structures that so many of us depend on, the results could be equally catastrophic. As it steadily closes in on a century of service, the Golden Gate Bridge remains as vital to the people and economy of California and the wider US today as it did when it first opened. Its construction really proves what humanity is capable of when presented with a challenge, and the ongoing projects to bolster its defences against the scariest of dangers really keeps that spirit alive. This remarkable structure remains the single most important piece of US road infrastructure today, more than 80 years after its completion. A powerful reminder of how construction shapes and enables so much of our world, and a truly compelling tool to inspire the next generation of engineers. If you've tried to buy, well, anything in the last couple of years, you've probably heard something like this. The global supply chain isn't functioning as it normally does. And you can't find lumber to build a new home. Well, you can't find products to stock the shelves. Now, you might be picturing busy ports in California, or of course, the ever given wedged in the Suez Canal. But a major bottleneck in the supply chain is actually right here, at the border between the US and Canada. The bridges that connect Windsor and Detroit are some of the most important bits of infrastructure in the region. In fact, they're so important that there's a kind of quiet competition underway to build the best one. The newest bridge on the block is the Gordie Howe International. Pushing the bounds of engineering, it's set to become the longest cable-stayed bridge in North America. But this is more than just a crossing, it's also a business opportunity, because yes, bridges can make money. And there's a lot of money to be made here. This is how one construction project is transforming the US-Canadian border. The US and Canada have the largest trading relationship in the world. In 2021, Canada overtook China as the US's top trading partner, exchanging $664 billion worth of goods. Nearly a quarter of that trade happens here. Detroit is a huge automaker, so a lot of vehicles and auto parts are shipped back and forth, along with things like cosmetics, vaccines, and even blood. Every day, more than $300 million worth of goods travel between Windsor and Detroit. That means a lot of taxes and tolls are being paid on bridges like this. That toll revenue often goes towards paying back the cost of construction and maintaining the structure. But while most toll bridges were taken over by state highway departments in the 20th century, there are still a handful of toll bridges owned by private companies. Like the 92-year-old Ambassador Bridge, just a couple of miles away from the new Gordie Howe. It's been privately run since 1929 and was taken over by billionaire Manuel Moron in the late 70s. Today, trucks pay $45 just to cross it. And there are a lot of trucks that cross the Ambassador Bridge. In 2021, an average of 263 trucks crossed the four-lane bridge every hour. On particularly busy days, it's more like 500 trucks an hour. All of that traffic is good for business, but not so much for travel time. 
time, and that's where the Gordy Howe Bridge comes in. Originally proposed nearly two decades ago, it'll provide an alternative to the overcrowded Ambassador Bridge, and getting it built is a massive undertaking. The project's divided up into four main components, roadwork at a new interchange in Michigan, the US point of entry, the Canadian point of entry, and of course, the bridge itself. Once complete, it'll be the longest cable-stayed bridge in North America, stretching 853 meters across the Detroit River. The $5.4 billion project is expected to finish in 2024, but it hasn't been an easy path to get here. There's been one major roadblock along the way. Remember Manuel Moron, the guy who owned the Ambassador Bridge? Well, he also owned the duty-free shops at the end of the bridge and tunnels, because why not own it all? Moron made a lot of money off this trade corridor, and he didn't want someone else taking potential traffic away from his empire. So when a new bridge was proposed back in 2004, he did everything he could to stop it. He sued the governments of Canada and Michigan to try and block its construction. Instead of a new, publicly owned bridge, he came up with the idea of building a second stretch of the Ambassador Bridge, which he would own. He spent millions of dollars trying to pass a ballot measure that would make it harder to get the bridge approved, but the measure didn't pass. He even ran a cable TV advert asking then-President Trump to block its construction. Dear Mr. President, there are two grand new bridges being proposed in Detroit between America and Canada. After nearly two decades of battles, Moron's efforts failed and construction began in 2018. The next year, Trump allocated $15 million in federal funds for the Gordie Howe Bridge. For all the time and effort that went into the political fight, the engineering challenge of actually building the bridge still lay ahead. The structure will be held up by a series of cables fanning out directly from two main towers which will bear the weight of the road. Now, that's different from a suspension bridge where the cables spread out across a suspender between the towers. For a while, suspension bridges were the go-to choice for mid-length crossings in America. Think the Golden Gate or George Washington Bridge. But as cable-stayed bridge design became cheaper, quicker and more efficient, it began to make a comeback. The Gordy Howe Bridge will be anchored by two massive towers on opposite sides of the Detroit River. Soaring 220 meters into the air, they're designed to resemble the curvature of an ice hockey stick. It's fitting given that this is Canada, and the bridge is named after a legendary hockey player. The towers are set to become some of the tallest structures in the region, but before building up, the crew had to drill down. To create a stable base for the towers, they dug six drill shafts deep into the bedrock below each tower leg, and then filled them with steel wires and concrete. From there, they built the base of the tower and started working their way up. Now, because the towers are so tall, there's a system of hydraulic pipes used to pump concrete from the ground all the way up to the top of the structure. The head of the tower will have steel anchor boxes surrounded by concrete, which will hold the base of the cable stays. The cables will then be strung from the top of the tower directly to the road deck. The main section of the bridge is going to be built over the water using something called the unbalanced cantilever method. Here's how it'll work. Starting from the towers on the shore, segments of the bridge will be added one at a time until they meet in the middle. At the edge of the road, a crane will place steel girders and floor beams to form the base of the road. Then precast concrete slabs are added and fresh concrete is poured on top to fuse them together. Finally, a crane will lift the cables from the road deck and secure them to the top of the tower. That process is repeated until both sides connect in the middle. Each section can take up to 12 days to install, and everything can be transported over the bridge itself, so there's no need to move anything through the water below. Once complete, there will be six lanes of traffic and a path for pedestrians and cyclists. This project comes at a crucial time for American infrastructure, as bridges all across the country are reaching the end of their lifespan. The Gordy Howe Bridge is an impressive feat of engineering, but better yet, it has the potential to shape one of the most important border crossings in the world. Maybe all that political drama will finally be water under the bridge. It's one of New York City's most famous landmarks, an incredible feat of 19th century engineering that forever changed bridge construction. But this much-loved crossing had a tumultuous beginning. 
and took nearly two decades to go from concept to completion. Its construction was marred by challenges and the death of its key visionary. The Brooklyn Bridge only exists today because of the determination and resolve of one woman. The Brooklyn Bridge was the vision of John Roebling. A gifted engineer, he lobbied for the construction of what he called the greatest bridge to ever be built, linking Manhattan and Brooklyn with what would be the first fixed crossing over the mighty East River. After a decade of campaigning, he finally won approval for the structure in 1867. But before construction began as he was surveying the site, Roebling's foot was crushed in the pilings of a pier as a barge came into dock. He contracted tetanus and died a few weeks later. The role of chief engineer fell to his son, Washington Roebling. Immersing himself in the bridge's construction, Washington developed decompression sickness from spending too much time in the caissons, which were pumped full of pressurized air. Washington was left debilitated, with some reports describing him as partially paralyzed and deaf, struggling with his eyesight. He'd go on to battle the effects of this illness for the rest of his life. Washington's wife was one of the few people to see him in this state and, under his guidance, pledged to continue his work. Emily Warren Roebling shared her husband's passion for engineering and knew the bridge herself, inside and out. Washington taught her everything he knew and she quickly gained an extensive knowledge of strength of materials, stress analysis, cable construction and catenary curves. With a main span of nearly 500 meters, Washington and Emily were building the longest suspension bridge in the world at that time. They were pioneering new methods of engineering and constructing the first ever twisted steel cable crossing. There weren't other existing structures to learn from. Initially, Emily worked as a secretary for Washington, becoming his eyes and ears on the construction site. She would take his orders and liaise with the workers, then report back. She soon took on greater roles, negotiating supply materials, overseeing contracts, and acting as a spokesman on behalf of her husband to the board of trustees. It wasn't long before she took on all the duties of the chief engineer. Though never given the official capacity, she essentially became the project manager of the Brooklyn Bridge. Emily and Washington Roebling designed the rest of the project together, building off the early plans left by Washington's father. On May 24, 1883, after 14 long years of construction, the bridge finally opened, and in honour of her dedication and work, Emily Warren Roebling was the first person to cross. In the 137 years since, the structure has become an icon of New York City, remaining a major crossing used by millions to this day. While Emily spent the first 20 years of her adult life fighting to build the Brooklyn Bridge, she would spend the rest of her life fighting for women's equality, becoming a leading figure in the movement. In a much acclaimed essay she later penned, titled A Wife's Disabilities, she passionately argued for women's rights, drawing on her own experiences of the discriminatory practices so often levied against her sex. Today, the bridge holds a plaque in dedication to Washington, John and Emily. And though the paper did acknowledge her contributions when the bridge first opened, in 2018, the New York Times finally published an obituary for Emily Warren Roebling, honoring her as the woman who built the Brooklyn Bridge. Turkey has a new bridge and it's big. We mean really big. The world's longest suspension bridge. Longest suspension bridge the world Grand has ever seen. Bridge lies over the Dardanelles Strait. Linking Turkey's east and west. It's the longest suspension bridge in the world, spanning 4.6 kilometers across the Dardanelles Strait. If you put it in London, it would dominate the skyline and rise higher than the Shard, the tallest building in Western Europe. This remarkable feat of engineering quite literally connects Europe to Asia and crosses one of the most important and busiest trade routes in the world. 
But constructing it wasn't easy, and the $2.8 billion mega project had to withstand earthquakes, storms, and some politics. This is how the world's longest suspension bridge was built. On the 18th of March 2022, Turkey's President Erdogan opened the 1915 Şenakale Bridge. It finished 18 months ahead of schedule, but had been a long time coming. Now, the Dardanelles Strait's always been a pretty critical piece of Turkey's geography. It's a narrow stretch of water that averages just four kilometers wide, and it's vital in connecting the Mediterranean to the Black Sea, giving some of the most resource-rich countries access to the outside world. This strait, along with the Bosphorus, also represents the effective border between Europe and Asia, and before the Şenakale was built, there were only three bridges and two tunnels linking the continents at this point, all located in Istanbul. As you might imagine, that caused plenty of congestion, and the crossing over the Dardanelles to solve the problem was first pitched way back in 1989. Famed bridge designer William Brown was even commissioned to design a structure following the success of his second Bosphorus Bridge in Istanbul in 1988. But the plan stalled. In 1995, the project was declared unfeasible, and it was more than two decades before another idea was put forward. This time around, the funds were secured, and engineering technology had progressed by 20 years. It was time to make history. Given the size of some ships using the strait, engineers opted for a suspension bridge design. Suspension bridge technology is more expensive than cable state bridge technology. But the biggest cable state bridge in the world has a span of around a little bit more than half of Chenagala, and you can't go much bigger than that for for this type of span which you have on Chenagala due to the uh, the shipping. Then you end up with a suspension bridge. These are huge. I mean, the vessels sailing through the Strait of Chenagala are among the biggest vessels in in the world. Two enormous 318-metre-high towers were planned on either end of the strait, supporting the two-kilometre main span between them, the longest of its kind in the world. A pair of 59,000-tonne caissons were submerged some 40 metres below the surface, one on the European side and one on the Asian side of the water. They would act as the tower's waterproof foundations. Additional steel platforms were then attached so the towers could be mounted above sea level. There's a number of, of high environmental and accidental loads that, that we are considering. The wind load, we are concerned for aerodynamic stability, and we are, of course, concerned with earthquake. We are concerned with, with the ship impact loads, but also a very special consideration for such a bridge here is, is to be able to handle the traffic loads. But of course, wind is the first and primary concern for such a long suspension bridge is aerodynamic stability. The Turkish government wanted the bridge to be opened in time for the country's centennial in 2023, and that put a strict deadline on every element of construction. The prefabrication requirement was primarily coming out of a, a request for, for fast construction time. We have had a very tight construction schedule for this bridge being one of the challenges, so actually it is today it's not even five years since we, we, we started on, on, on this project. Once the towers were finished, the cables between them were then strung strand by strand in a process that took more than 162,000 kilometers worth of wire. That's enough to loop around the globe four times. The main deck was then suspended from the cables an incredible 72 meters clear of the water. The strait is notorious for strong winds and large annual storms, so the deck was built with a twin box girder structure with a nine meter gap in between. That helps wind to pass through the bridge more easily and improves its stability. So you have what we call a twin box. We split the box in two. We have a gap in the middle and then they're transversely connected with cross beams. That works much better and gives much better aerodynamic stability. Now complete, some 45,000 vehicles are expected to cross the bridge every day. It's transformed a ferry journey that at its worst could take upwards of five hours to a mere six minute drive. And despite its $2.8 billion cost, the crossing's projected to add $5.7 billion to the economy. It's actually all part of a wider infrastructure blitz that President Erdogan has spearheaded across the nation, including a new airport in Istanbul, rail and road tunnels beneath the Bosphorus, and most ambitiously of all, a proposed $15 billion canal in Istanbul that would effectively turn the city into an island. 
Canal Istanbul is a 45-kilometre waterway running parallel to the Bosphorus Strait, connecting the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. But many say the multi-billion dollar project is far too costly given Turkey's economic struggles. It's fair to say Erdogan's had his share of criticism for these infrastructure plans. Opposition leaders call the mega-projects nothing but distractions ahead of the country's 2023 election. We are against it because it threatens Istanbul completely. Its water, its nature, its security and earthquake safety. It threatens life in this city. As if its record-breaking engineering weren't enough, there's actually more to the 1915 Chinakale Bridge than ridiculous amounts of steel and a big span. Firstly, the whole project is wrapped up in national symbolism. Painted in the colours of the Turkish flag, its 2,023 metre midspan is an allusion to the Turkish Republic's 100th anniversary in 2023. And the name of the bridge refers to a World War I battle fought on this very site. But it's the contrast with war that's perhaps its most impressive trait. The bridge was assembled by an international team from all corners of the globe. Cranes were shipped from Australia, designs were drawn up in Denmark, and finance came from South Korea or to build a bridge in Turkey that connects Asia and Europe. A hundred years ago, many of these countries were at war with each other, fighting on the very shores that the bridge is now built on. The 1915 Battle of Gallipoli, which the bridge commemorates, is one seared into the histories of both Turkey and Australia. The world's new, longest suspension bridge is a testament not just to engineering, but to what can be accomplished when nations combine their talents. At a time of such uncertainty and conflict, this structure reminds us not just of the power of construction, but of what we can achieve on this planet when we work together. This is the longest ocean crossing in the world. Consisting of three cable-stayed bridges, three man-made islands, and one of the world's longest undersea tunnels, the entire project has taken eight years to construct, at a cost of over 15 billion US dollars. The 55-kilometre crossing connects Hong Kong with Macau and Zhuhai, drastically reducing journey times between the three cities and standing as a testament to the engineering might of the Chinese. This is the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge. China's Pearl River Delta is one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, with some 68 million people living in the cities that surround the mouth of the river. The rapid development of Hong Kong in the 1980s and 1990s led to numerous new road connections across the border into mainland China. These road connections continued to be improved on the eastern side of the delta. However, connections to the west were lacking and the most direct route involved a 160 kilometer, four and a half hour car journey. Following the return of the British and Portuguese colonies of Hong Kong and Macau to China in 1997 and 1999 respectively, Chinese and Hong Kong authorities explored the feasibility of linking the two sides of the river delta to drive economic growth and improve unity. With clear economic advantages, the chance to increase employment opportunities, reduce congestion at border checkpoints and to cut carbon emissions, the project was approved. Construction began on the 296 kilometer Chinese section of the crossing in 2009. This element takes the route across 22.9 kilometers of elevated roadway and three cable-stayed bridges before meeting a man-made island and ducking beneath the waves into a 6.7 kilometer undersea tunnel. With an estimated 4,000 ships crossing the Pearl River Delta every day, this bridge tunnel system allows large ships to pass without the need to navigate around or under bridges. A similar style of crossing connects Copenhagen in Denmark to Malmo in Sweden across the Orson Strait. The roadway re-emerges from its undersea tunnel onto another man-made island on the Hong Kong side of the crossing, close to the city's airport. This section of the crossing commenced construction in 2011 and links to Hong Kong itself via a 12-kilometre elevated roadway. 
In total, the project consumed over 420,000 tonnes of steel and some 30,000 cubic metres of concrete. With an original completion date of 2016, the scheme was delayed when environmental concerns over the bridge's impact on local dolphin populations were raised, pushing completion back to 2017. Due to Hong Kong and Macau's special administrative status from mainland China, checkpoints are required to facilitate customs and the passage of people around the region. These checkpoints are located at either end of the bridge and serve as a means of resetting the traffic direction as vehicles change over to the left-hand side when entering Hong Kong and Macau from mainland China. While the project has been hailed by many as an engineering achievement, it has not been without controversy, with some questioning its lengthy delays, cost overruns and worker safety during construction. Furthermore, in 2017, Hong Kong officials arrested a number of lab technicians after concrete strength test results were shown to have been falsified. Following these arrests, Hong Kong's highways department conducted their own tests on the concrete and the structure was in fact deemed safe with engineers stating that the bridge had been designed to withstand a magnitude 8 earthquake, a super typhoon, or a collision with a 300,000 ton cargo vessel. Now completed and despite its setbacks, this 55 kilometer ocean crossing is the centerpiece of the Pearl River Delta, a remarkable infrastructure project that better connects one of the world's most populated regions and opens economic opportunities for southern China. They say everything's bigger in Texas, and that's definitely the case for the state's latest megaproject, the New Harbor Bridge. Stretching 506 meters across Corpus Christi's ship canal, this will be one of the largest cable-stayed bridges in America, replacing the aging structure that stands there today. That is, if it ever gets finished. Halfway through the project, investigators halted construction after they found a number of safety concerns that, if left untreated, could cause the bridge to collapse. Now the project is over budget and way past its original 2020 deadline, and officials are racing to engineer their way out of this nearly billion dollar problem. With tens of thousands of people relying on the old Hobber Bridge every day, the pressure is on to fix the new one before it's too late. Corpus Christi, Texas, home to one of the largest US ports, this mid-sized city has served as an important gateway into the country for over a century. And over the years, it's been engineered to adapt as the world changed around it. To accommodate the rapidly growing oil and gas industries following World War II, the port needed to build a wider passage and a larger bridge for ships to pass through. And so the state took on one of its biggest construction challenges yet the original Harbour Bridge. It was an incredible feat of engineering built without the use of modern computers. And when it opened in 1959, the bridge's massive through art structure was so tall that supertankers could enter the port for the first time, igniting further economic growth. It went on to serve Texas for more than half a century, but was only designed with a 50-year lifespan. And as the decades have rolled by, the structure has yet again become outdated compared to the size of bridges in today's ports. So now the state is building another new bridge to accommodate larger ships, meet updated safety measures and lower maintenance costs. Not only will the old bridge be demolished, but over 10 kilometers of new bridge and roadways are also being designed and developed. The new design will be a cable-stayed bridge where the road deck is supported by cables connected directly to pylons or towers. Now that's different from a suspension bridge where the cables spread out across a suspender between the towers. On the new harbour bridge, cables will stretch from the towers to the road deck to carry six lanes of traffic and a shared bike and pedestrian path. The deck will sit an incredible 62 meters above the surface of the water, high enough to clear the massive new ships coming in. Construction started back in 2016 and was due to finish by 2020, but here we are in 2023 with a half-built structure. So what happened? 
Well, to be perfectly frank, a lot has gone wrong here. Firstly, work on the bridge has been suspended not once, but twice. Construction first paused in 2019 following the shocking collapse of a pedestrian bridge in Florida that resulted in several deaths and injuries. Now, you might be wondering what a bridge all the way over in Florida has to do with this one in Texas. Well, the collapse over there was due to an error in its initial design by Fig Bridge Group, the same engineers then working on the new Harbour Bridge. Investigators looked into the Texas Bridge designs and ultimately removed Fig from the project, replacing it with new firms. Construction then finally restarted in 2021. But not long after the bridge began taking shape, an independent study conducted by a third-party group found there were still five key safety concerns that could lead to a collapse. Construction on the main span was halted again in 2022, and the project's budget grew from around $800 million to nearly a billion. Here's what exactly went wrong and how it's being fixed. The first issue is with the foundation system. The north and south towers of the bridge sit on top of a giant concrete slab the size of two basketball courts. Underneath each of them is a series of 64 meter drilled shafts filled with concrete and steel to transfer the weight of the bridge above down onto solid ground. But the investigation found that under certain conditions like high winds, the shafts might not support the weight of the pylons and could sink into the ground. To address this, the team is extending the foundations and adding more drilled shafts below each tower, enabling them to hold more weight without sinking. The second issue has to do with the foundation caps on each of the towers. These sit on top of a group of piles in order to equally distribute the weight to all the elements underneath. Think of it like a handful of straws when you grip them close together. The investigation found that the demand on the piles greatly exceeded their loading capacity, which ultimately could have led to the bridge's collapse. The fix here is to create more space underground so the piles don't bend and slip out of place above the concrete. The piles will be moved deeper underground, which will be supported by the newly drilled shafts from the first solution. The third problem has to do with the delta frame design, a critical element in a cable-stayed bridge. This part bears and transfers the weight of the structure onto the cables, a bit like a mast on a ship. Building code requires this project to use non-compressed steel throughout the delta frame in order to strengthen it. But the investigation found that the harbour bridge design didn't have the necessary reinforcements, putting the structure at risk of cracking. To strengthen the connections, engineers are roughing the concrete surfaces and adding rebar that crosses the interface. The fourth problem was something called uplift occurring at two of the piers. This means that instead of the weight transferring down into the cables near the towers, it was causing the structure to rise up. And with the bridge's current design, the bearings aren't capable of controlling this movement if uplift occurs. This could ultimately loosen the connections and cause other maintenance issues. So engineers have added rebar to the last two segments on both ends of the bridge. They also made modifications to some of these external bearings to prevent decompression. The fifth and final issue was caused by placement of the cranes during construction of the main span. The way the equipment was set up during construction exposed it to high winds, which could cause parts of the incomplete bridge deck to twist. Now, workers are adding counterweights to balance out any potential movement from the weather. Then, in April of 2023, yet another issue emerged when one of these cranes caught fire, injuring two workers as debris fell below. The cause of the flames is currently being investigated. We reached out to the companies involved, but they declined to comment. The work to fix the new harbour bridge is only just beginning to start, but as the original structure continues to age, it's important to get this one right and quickly. Construction projects like this are a high-wire act, and the race to fix the Texas Harbour Bridge is a powerful reminder of the trust we put in this industry. Infrastructure has the power to shape millions of people's lives for the better, but only if it's built right. This video was sponsored by Masterworks. You can skip their waitlist at the link below. Don't forget that we're inspiring the next generation of builders through our investment into BrickBorrow, a fantastic LEGO subscription service. You can learn more and get started today over at brickborrow.com. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, 
make sure you subscribe to the B1M.